Time for another story. Bye-bye. Just about six miles away called Sheep Creek. Salmon Siding. Do we know well, if there's anything else now? Yeah, it's called Salmo today, but the original name was Salmon Siding, and uh, kind of in a fascinating corner of British Columbia, most people would pass it by today, but it has an intriguing history. I think of it more as uh, sort of near the fruit country of the uh, of the Kootenays. Yeah, it's not not too far off Creston, actually. You have to go over the highway and the Skyway into Creston, but it's it's really old, old mining territory. And what were they looking for? Looking for gold. Gold. Almost entirely, with some silver lead zinc in the latter stages. All right. Salmo, or Salmon Siding. Salmon Siding. Named after a railway, I presume? Yep. Okay. We're going to Salmon Siding right after we come back from this break to pursue gold. Don't go away. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Town. Salmon Siding, the location we're talking about today. We may know it better as Salmo. Mm -hmm. Gold was the attraction. Yeah, Mike, it, it, it really, they discovered gold there. They were, they were north of Salmon Siding, or Salmo was Weimar, and north of that is, is Nelson. So this is right in the heart of the Kootenai mining country. And by the 1890s, they were starting to drift into all these little valleys around Salmon Siding. And probably the best discovery they made was right in Sheep Creek, which is a little creek about almost six miles due east of, 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 of Sa Salmo itself. And, you know, there were a lot of mines in there. There, there, was, there was the Nuggets, and there was the Mother Lode, and there was the Kootenai Bell, and the famous Queen. And the Queen was uh, probably the premier producer. Started producing in about 1900, produced right through to about 1928. Now, what was the first load that attracted these people here? I mean, did they come for Rossland and then move this way, or did they, or did, what, what brought them, and then how did they drift into these areas? Probably two attractions, three attractions, Mike. Rossland, the famous Golden yeah. City, the Silvery Slow Can, which would be Sandon and, and, and um, you know, all those areas in there, which would be Three Forks and New Denver and Silverton, and, of course, Nelson itself. Were those places overcrowded, and people found that they couldn't get work, so they moved out? Uh, acted like a magnet for prospectors from all over the West. And so these prospectors began drifting in, found that these other areas were heavily staked, Mike. And when they were heavily staked, they, they started to drift out into other areas that weren't as well known. One of these areas was Sheep Creek. There just seemed to be always enough ore bodies to, to accommodate nearly everybody. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> they were looking, they were looking at, initially, the key was, was gold, then silver, and then the, then the baser metals. Characters always make up a good chunk of uh, the mining history. Yeah, in, in Salmo itself, we had a lot of individuals who were quite well known. Daniel Corbin came in there. He was one of the one of the Corbins of, of railway fame from the Spokane area, and he put a line through there, the Nelson and Fort Shepherd line, and in the late 1890s. And we had a lot of other individuals, nicknames like Canada Bill and uh, and uh, Klondike Mike Mahoney was in there. Big Alex uh, McDermott was there. He was the guy who was eventually killed in a, a bare-knuckle brawl in, in Weimar. So he had a lot of hard-nosed characters in Salmo. It was a very interesting town, tough town, one of the toughest towns. I think Salmo and Weimar, probably the two toughest towns in the West Kootenai. W what made for that? I mean, uh, why? Well, I, I think m partly because there weren't any steady lawmen in those areas. There were lawmen who came into service and once in a while if there was a fight or a murder or, or a very, very difficult case to, to resolve, but generally speaking, the, the, the lawmen were at places like Nelson and, and Rossland. And here, here's Salmo in the early years. This is about 1912, Mike, and it shows some of the main street of Salmo at that time. And Salmo is reflecting what the mines are doing. They're starting to boom in that Sheep Creek Valley. And here's, here's another shot uh, of, of Salmo in the, in the early years, again about 1912, showing another section of the main street. So Salmo had two or three things going for it. It had mines, and it had a, a big lumber mill as well. But the mines were probably the most attractive thing for most guys in the West. But what population? How many miners did this attract? Well, probably there were about 500 people in Salmo itself at the time, and then about uh, several hundred more up the Sheep Creek Valley, Mike. So this would mean that those other mines up the Sheep Creek Valley, which were hitting, were hitting ore. A lot of those, a lot of those mines up the Sheep Creek Valley, such as the Queen, one ounce a ton for a long time. One ounce a ton. That's so money, very rich. Money was no object. People had lots of it to spare. Well, sure they did. Uh, silver dollars, you know, when you're talking about gold, are uh, kind of trivial, but uh, they, they're lovely things to have. Yeah. And most of, all of these are American silver dollars. Yeah. What's, uh, what's the reason for that? Well, in Selmo at this time, this is, this is, the, this is the type of, uh, of currency that was in wide use. First of all, the miner didn't like paper money, Mike. Mm -hmm. So he, 
he preferred silver dollars, so he dealt in silver dollars. And he would be going, he would go into the store and he would deal usually with American silver dollars because prior to 1935, there weren't any Canadian silver dollars. So American silver dollars were, were state of the art and they were, they were the currency, the commonly accepted currency. And of course, some of the, some of the Canadian silver halves and quarters with, mixed in with American money and accepted at par. So those ones are of the era and they evoke a, uh, a sense that this is the coin of the realm, this was at the gambling table, sure. this was, sure. this was tips and things like that. Once in a while, even today, when they rip down an old house in this area, in Nelson, in Salmo, in Weimar, they do discover a cache of coins occasionally. <laughs> Just to keep on the lookout for that. This is not a, a Salmo mine. This is the famous second relief, and the second relief is southwest of Salmo, and it was one of the it's in that triangle of mines there, and, and it's really quite interesting because it was a very, very good producer. For some, for some years, it produced up to two ounces a ton, Mike, which is spectacular all, and kept on producing decade after decade. Why did they call it the second relief? I well, mean, I was can't the first tell you. Relief <laughs> yeah, well, there was a relief and then the second relief. So I imagine this was on the, on the original, they had the relief mine, and then they discovered a better mine, which was the second relief. Two ounces of gold to the ton. What yeah. would that work out to? Would that be like a Today? monthly production or a weekly production? Or no, it wouldn't be. It would be, it would be probably, uh, I don't know how many tons they ran through, but they would, they would run through thousands and thousands of tons per year on the second relief. And I haven't got those figures right at my fingertips. But um, it was one of the big producers. Maybe. Ooh, a lot of money. I mean, do we know who, well, where did this go? Did this go to Spokane like so yeah, much of the Most of the mines in the Salmo and the Weimar area were, were owned by uh, mining magnates in Spokane. Yeah. But the way these little places all cropped up, like, like there's no real gold in Salmo, it's all around the neighborhood, but other hotels sprang up all around the, sure. the bit, and this is called the Mersey Hotel. Yeah. Is this a, a Liverpudlian or somebody? Well, yes, yeah, actually, he was, was an Englishman, and that's why he called it the Mersey, and this is at a little place called Erie, which once was called the North Fork. This is just kind of due west of, of Salmo itself. You know, I can understand how people get confused because it's uh, Erie, which used to be known as North Fork, which was near Salmo. I mean, yeah. I mean, stories have to be... Uh, this is all in the through. second relief area, okay? So the second relief, they, they, were, they were tapping the miners who came in from the second relief. Okay, so the Mersey Hotel and Bar gave yeah. relief to some people, but this one was, I guess, the uh, empress of the time, was now it? this, even for its day, is a very, is a beautiful hotel. This is the original Salmo Hotel. They had about five hotels in the town, and with a, with a hotel like this, of course, it reflected the prosperity in the area. And the area, that's about 1913, Mike, probably around 1912 or 13. And those mines were booming up in Cheap Creek. And who'd stay there? I mean, local uh, gamblers coming in to fleece sure. the miners? Uh, sure. Some of the tin Stock horns. promoters, uh, real estate types? Sure. I mean, all those. There'd be the mine owners, there'd be the tin horns, of course, who made a regular circuit through the Kootenays, hitting on payday whenever they could. And, uh, and a, lot of, a lot of individuals who were, who were, who were promoting stock in the area. Yeah. When did you discover this area? Because we've got some artifacts here that, uh, that are from the region, this old yeah. spittoon. Yeah. I mean, when did you discover this region yourself? Well, I, I wanted through this area when I was a kid, Mike, so uh, that's over 40 years ago. And, uh, and I, uh, it has a, a peculiar feeling, especially when you get out of Salmo itself, into the Erie area, or into that area of Sheep Creek itself. You can almost hear the echoes from the past. Yeah, this, this echoes. I guess if you, if you hit it right, it would yeah. echo anyway. Yeah. And the interesting thing about a spittoon, it was used for all sorts of different things. There was a spittoon, of course, as dirty as and, and, it's, and it's brass, but it has a certain sort of character. Once in a while, they were used in a fight, too. They are, they're pretty brutal, because quite often they're weighted, you see. Let's see whether there's any dents in it. You can, there's a few dents in it. <laughs> yeah. this, this, they could have been a, just a boot, but they, they could have been deciding the determining factor in some brawl. Sure. Next to it is a, uh, it looks like a coffee grinder. Yeah, that's a coffee grinder, and it's a small hotel coffee grinder out of the West Kootenai. And uh, typical, some of the other coffee grinders were wheeled coffee grinders, but in the early days, they used, generally used a smaller one like this. Let's see, and these are in the Canada West collection. You've, yeah. you've lovingly acquired these from one source or another. Yeah, and most of those are documented, Mike. When we're talking, again, I, 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 I'm trying to always locate myself. I mean, I can see Salmo, I can mm -hmm. see it on the map, but yeah. where is it now in relation to the other components we're talking about, the, the Queen Mine, or for example? Give us a sort of a well, quick geographic rundown. This, this map indicates, you see Salmo on the extreme left-hand side of the screen, and then, then you go down slightly south, and then you go along an old wagon road, and the wagon road follows the road of today pretty well, Mike. 
And then you went up, this map is 1909, sketch made at the time, and you can see the, the mother load and the nugget and the Kootenai Bell and the famous queen and, uh, and uh, some of the other mines in that immediate area. Now, why didn't a town grow up where that is? Why did, they, why did Salmo stay as the, uh, as the source of supply? Well, there was a settlement there. There was a small settlement in the mouth of, mouth of Wolf Creek, and later on there was a town in there, which very few people know anything about, and that was called Sheep Creek. But it never developed. It was always worth more. Heck, we've got the town established sure. in Salmo. We'll do all our shipping right through there. Sheep Creek didn't develop until the, what we call the second gold rush in this area. Okay. And uh, when did that gold rush occur? Well, the first gold rush, late 1890s till about 1914, just about the outbreak of World War I. Then there was a little lull in mining, and then it started picking up just very, very slightly in 1919, but it didn't pick up much, and it stayed that way until the price of gold ran to over $30 an ounce from $20.67 an ounce, Mike, and then it'd take a big jump, and that's a 50% jump. That was enough to, to, uh, to produce uh, mining activity all through this region again. So not all the wealth was taken out in the first rush. When we come back, we're going to talk about the second rush, which occurred in the post-First World War era around the 1930s. We'll do that right after this break. Welcome back to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts with Bill Barley and Salmo and Sheep Creek and all these other places. Yeah. A lot of things collapsed around the uh, start of World War I. Yeah. Uh, real estate dropped. People were closing mines left and right, but yeah. it came back right after the war, Salmo. Yeah, it did. There, you know, right through the war, there was a shortage of men, first of all. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the price of gold was still $20.67 an ounce. But after 1919, this is 1919 photograph, Mike, shows a team leaving for the Sheep Creek mine. And the interesting part of this team, by the way, if you examine that photograph, is there were four mules and two horses. Did they so there's a team of horses, they're the wheels, excuse me. Did they not often match up? Did horses and mules not get along or something? It wasn't general. Usually you had an all-mule team or an all-horse team. Yeah. And, uh, but the interesting thing was, between 1919 and right till 1932, there was still kind of a lull in mining, a little bit of interest. They knew there was some gold there, but it required a lot of exploration work, required a lot of money, so they kind of held on to that, that ground. A lot of people held on to it originally, but in 1932, the price of gold jumped to over $30 an ounce U.S., and this meant a terrific impact in the mining community all across the West. They and flooded back from where? Oh, they flooded back from all over the West Kootenays, from parts of the state. A lot of this ground was owned by Spokane interest as well. So they came back in and said, ah, with the price of gold now at over $30 U.S. an ounce, almost $35 an ounce, we can make a go of it. So they started putting in mines in production, Mike, and some of these mines they put in production were really marvelous producers. This is the Reno. Picture taken in 1936. Shows some of the workings of the Reno and shows uh, a covered walkway where the workers went up because you'd get six and eight feet of snow in the winter here, and the guys would have to actually have to ski to work. And <laughs> with, with, the, with the increase in, in mining activity, and some of these mines, Mike, had 100 to 150 men working for them. They were, they were great producing mines. And, with, and the result was, of course, that instead of building a town or rebuilding Salmo, they went closer by. They built a little town in there called Sheep Creek, 111 houses. And I know it was 111 houses because I talked to the guy, an old guy called Chris Hansen, an old friend of mine who used to service those houses. He counted the water and everything else. So there were 111 houses in Sheep Creek. You could go up Sheep Creek today. You can't see hardly any sign of it at all. The occasional depression. But the, the production from this area, Mike, was nothing short of spectacular. Some of these mines were producing several gold bricks a month, and these were real gold bricks. They were 11 and 3 quarter inches long, the bigger bricks, about 4 inches wide, and they weighed up to 100 pounds each. So that, you know, you had a lot of money coming. In fact, the interesting thing is, and old Chris told me this story, they were coming back in a, in a truck from, uh, one of the little trucks that they drove back from the mines, and he was supposed to pick up the gold, which he did. He picked it up in a sack, put it in the truck. Truck broke down halfway to, to Salmo. Well, they didn't want to pack 100 pounds of gold out, so they left the golden truck. Walked into Salmo, got, got a guy to come out and pick up. Gold was still sitting there. And this was not unusual, because what really happened, Mike, was uh, that when, they, when, when they produced the gold, the common, the common thing to do was transport it down to Salmo, put it in a mailbag, and they simply threw the mailbag on the platform waiting for the train to, and no to be standing around at all. 
And as far as I know, they didn't lose one bar of gold. And there were literally hundreds of bars of gold went out that way, put in a mailbag, throw the mailbag on the platform, go back to the mine. And nobody touched it. In this, in a town which was reputed to be the toughest next to Weimar, I mean, uh, yes, very interesting. Ne'er do wells that would have been attracted to this. Well, I mean, do you have any inkling as to why there was this outburst of honesty when it came to gold bars lying around? Mike, I can't explain it, <laughs> but a number of people have explained it to me, and I wouldn't question old Chris Hansen. I wouldn't question me either, but I just find that remarkable. You know, well, several people have told me this. They were there. And this is one of the mines. This is in the Sheep Creek Valley. And, uh, and this is typical of the mines in the area. They were a big proposition, Mike. This, this photograph was probably taken around 1938 or 1939. See one of the miners walking across the bridge. Yeah. Typical of the time. Little old truck in the back there sure. with jewels on it. You can see that. Yeah. And this gives you kind of a pan view. This is, this is so good because you can see that the, the, the terrain these people are working in. Oh, yeah. This is, this is the Sheep Creek Valley. And Wolf Creek comes down that little draw, and Sheep Creek's on the, on the front part of the, of the photograph here. And you, this was Sheep Creek Mines, which was a big producer in the area. Now, it wasn't just Sheep Creek Mines, Mike. The Reno was big, Sheep Creek Mines. And to the south, you had places like the HB and the Emerald, and they were, they were primarily lead, silver, zinc producers, whereas in the Sheep Creek Valley, primarily gold producers. How many mines? Have you ever totaled them up? Oh, be dozens of mines, operating mines in there, but probably about eight big ones, eight to ten big ones, if you include the Emerald and the HB. Eight? And you said that they employed like a hundred men? Oh, yeah, a hundred, hundred and fifty men. Yeah, big operation. That's big operation. Just, I mean, you're talking, a, you're talking a thousand men right there just working in those mines That's at that right. period. Sure, sure. This was a booming region. And, you know, the interesting part of it, Mike, is that, is that in this particular area, they had... One of the great treasure stories of, of the West Kootenai comes into play here. The, sh the Sheep Creek draw produced one huge mine, and it was the Queen Mine. And the Queen Mine between 1900, and here's, here's, here's we'll take a little, little closer look at it. On the left-hand side of this po photograph, you can see the old workings of the Queen, and that is the que that's 30 years after the Queen has seen its heyday. Mm -hmm. And the Queen Mine produced from over 100,000 tons of ore, it produced over 57,000 ounces of gold. That's about half an ounce a ton on average. Pretty good. But their, their mill was so inefficient, Mike, that they lost 30,900 ounces in the tailings. Just, just the percentage, if we're getting... That's right. They got 65%, Mike, so that 30,900 ounces, which they lost, and they found this out by, by running assays on it, and they were prepared to lose it. It was such a... Such a prodigious producer, that they were prepared to lose it. But what happened is, they ran that, those tailings through the mill, and that gold, in very, very fine particles, actually flowed into Sheep Creek. And in 1914, those miners in the area realized that there was over 30,000 ounces of very fine gold in Sheep Creek, just below the Queen Mine and downstream. So that this is one of the, one of the great treasure stories of that particular area, because that 30,000 ounces of gold now, Mike, at, say, $480 an ounce, or 31,000, is worth almost exactly $15 million. And it's sitting in Sheep Creek as we speak. It's sitting somewhere in Sheep Creek as we speak. Now, there, there are several sort of variables in this. A, if, if those tailings had run out into the creek in high water, that fine gold would have been carried farther down the creek. But if it ran out during low water, which much of it did, it'd still be in the immediate vicinity. But gold, of course, being very heavy, tends to sink to bedrock. And I've wandered up and down that creek. There's no visible bedrock in any, any area. But the old miners, they staked the whole creek, hoping they could recover it. They didn't recover it. And that missing $15 million still sitting in Sheep Creek. Now, is it going to be very difficult to recover? This is gold that's been through the milling process. It must be in, in dust form. By it now. is, Mike. It's, it's, it's really very, very fine gold. And I would think it would be extremely difficult to recover. Do yeah. we have technology today that could recover a high percentage of it? I don't think so at the present time. I think that particular cache of gold is going to stay there probably for another decade. Because they say that the oceans of the world have more gold than has ever been mined out oh, of it, sure. but it's just technologically we can't get at it. This may be a similar kind of thing, but think yeah. $15 million worth of yeah. gold 
But that isn't the key to the area, Mike. The yeah, area even itself... Even that's not the key. Yeah, that is not the key. <clears throat> the area itself is so steeped in history and has a, that peculiar mood and atmosphere that you find in some of these old mining towns. And I, I like wandering all through that area. And some people call it the Golden Triangle. Because if you look at that area and you examine a map of it, and you, you talk about the gold, which starts at Weimar and then spreads out, and the base spreads out, reaching into areas like the Second Relief and, and, and south of Salmo, along, that, uh, the, along the highway uh, and skyway area, and this is really the Golden Triangle. And I am inclined to think that even after that first rush on the 1890s, they found other mines, such as the HB and the Emerald. I think that there are probably still mines in that particular area extremely rich, probably not very far below the surface, because it's an interesting geological structure if you really examine the, the maps of the area and the history of the area. And many old miners in that Kootenai region, that part of the West Kootenai, agree with me. They think that there are other great discoveries still to be made in that, in that salmon, salmon or Salmo River area, sometimes called the Salmon River area. Now, I mean, why are people not staking it? Or is it heavily staked right now? Is that country taken care of, basically? There, is, there aren't many operating mines in that country right now, Mike, but almost all that old ground is still staked, waiting for the third rush. The third rush. Yeah. Can you predict when this is going to happen? Because it seems to me that all over British Columbia, and uh, Tulami and Similkameen, there's lots of gold that's yeah. sitting in there, uh, probably yeah. still in the, in the Barkerville, Caribou area, there's gold. When's the, when's the next? Do, well, do we need gold to go to eight hundred, a thousand dollars? I don't think so. I think there's a lot of activity now, and they're using a you know, leaching method to recover a lot of it. I think probably the 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 impetus will be probably when the gold goes to five hundred dollars U.S. and that isn't very far. You know, it's about a hundred dollars to go. When it gets to that, uh, I think that there will be another gold rush in the area. So today it's been salmon siding or salmo as we know yep. it now. Yep. Sheep Creek, yep. Hidden Creek, Wolf Creek, yep. all this area, yep. and with $15 million of dust sitting in Sheep Creek for the man with the technology to snap it up. No doubt about that at all. All documented, Mike. Imagine $15 million in gold dust. Well, we'll imagine that until next week when we come back again and uh, tell another story about the gold trails and ghost towns of British Columbia, Northwest United States, and maybe into the Klondike. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time when Gold Trails and Ghost Towns continue. Bye-bye.